Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tone Orange Podcast. I'm your host, James, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Dave Cashman is our guest today. How's the farm, Dave? Not too bad, lads. How are you doing? We're here to talk about trauma and farm education. But before we get into that, you're from a big uh, GA family, aren't you? I am. Well yeah. known? Yeah, relatively well known anyway, yeah. So, so you're a black rock man? Black rock man, yeah. Rockies so. is your club? Yeah, yeah. We played senior up until a couple of years ago there. Where were that? Yeah, so... Were you part of the carry on during COVID? With no, the I actually missed that. I'd say you were in the middle of that now, Dave. I missed it. So for the people that don't know, they won a county fine, which is a big thing in Cork. Yeah, it was, yeah. And, but it was in the middle of COVID when you were not supposed to be outside your door. I'm sure yeah. them gurriers out the south side <laughs> took no heed of that. I oh, wouldn't know, I wasn't there at all. <laughs> but listen, if you win a county fine, you have to celebrate it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I, I was lucky. I, I won two early on in my career. Like, I was only about 18 or 19, and I played in four senior finals. Go ahead. Two, one, two. But, um, yeah. Your uncle is one of the most decorated hurlers of all time. Yeah, Tom and, well, Jim won a few All-Irelands, and Tom would have won four, and he was, I think Tom was, um, Selected on the team of the century back in the two, and he actually, uh, you, you, I remember you sent me a, a text message there. You, you were right with Jimmy Barry. Jimmy that's right. Yeah. Then he didn't win the Echo Car Furler all the time there. No, no, he that didn't. Very recently, like, actually, so. we had uh, the honour of interviewing um, Dave uh, or Teddy Mack actually not long ago, not long before he passed away. Yeah, you know that was a huge, huge shock, wasn't it? Yeah, and actually, Jim and Teddy would be best friends. Like all their, yeah. they would have been the same age, and Teddy was he was only with him the week before, so it was a shock and a huge yeah. loss to, yeah. to Cork, GA oh. and Cork in general. Like, yeah, you know. absolutely, absolutely. But um, you're doing a PhD, and how we met initially was we both got the same scholarship for the PhDs. I'm going to come away to do this podcast, but you're nearly finished now. Yeah. And you're going to talk to us a little bit about that. Kind of, yeah. But yeah. you're also the principal in Educate Together, Southley. Southley Educate Together, yeah. So we're a new school over in the, the um, over basically based in the grounds of Clutch to Stefan Nath. And, and did you start out as a primary school teacher? I did. Uh, well, I started out, like, I suppose when I go back, I finished school and uh, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, to be honest with you. Um, do you know, I went to college and I initially did arts and... After that, then I did a post grad in UCC in business economics. It was that time, it was kind of around the time of the Celtic Tiger, and everyone was kind of saying you should go into kind of businessy kind of subjects, you know. And I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, and really I had zero interest in it, you know. I was always involved in hurling and I was always involved in sport and coaching, and I coached a lot of teams underage, and I got a fierce amount of enjoyment out of it and helping basically. The young teams in Black Rock, and we, we kind of had a bit of success along the way too. But you know, I got really huge amount of enjoyment out of it, and I decided to go back teaching. And I enrolled, I got got into the post grad in education, and I one of my first jobs then I, I taught in Douglas, and I was doing a bit of sub teaching in Douglas. This was before I was qualified back mm. in back those days. They were looking for, there was a sheer, serious shortage of teachers, and uh, I was kind of doing a bit of subbing in um. You, in Douglas, in the, the the autism class over in Douglas Boy School, and they were looking for a sub to teach in the autism class. At the time in Cork, there was only two autism classes. There was one in called Padre Pio in Churchfield, and the other was in Douglas. So they'd kind of share subs. Um, so I went up and I was teaching in Skull Padre Pio, and I went up expecting to be teaching there, and they, I, I got put into the early start. Oh yeah, oh, yeah it was great crack. And <laughs> I remember the parents every day. It was my first kind of real kind of insight into the north side they used to be calling me kindergarten cop there for every day when they collected <laughs> you know so um so i taught there for a couple of weeks and i stayed there for nearly the bones of a year you know i was teaching there for the bones of a year and ended up teaching then i got a permanent job down in strawberry hill in sunday's well boy school yeah and um, taught there for a number of years and i became principal deputy principal and principal there after about like six years, um, as principal. That's some achievement. Yeah. For a teacher to be going and become deputy and then principal after six years. Yeah. What age, yeah? 30. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's common for somebody so young to be in senior position like that. Yeah, it wouldn't be uncommon. No, definitely not. You know, like we'll probably talk about that at some point. It's, it's a really, the, the job now is kind of very difficult. It comes with a lot of occupational stress, I suppose, you know, and but uh, yeah, it, it is a lot, a lot more common now. Yeah. And it, can, I, can I ask you something? Okay. You, you know, when you have the old school teachers, you know, teachers that myself and James would have had in primary and secondary school in one section. Right? Yeah, that's the wall. Yes, yeah. the wall and the control but, job. But, like. but they're, they're, they're more or less maybe coming to their retirement age and yeah. whatever. But then you have the new, younger generation of teachers coming in. 
how like I often wondered how the new generation teachers would get on with the older ones and their kind of the old their strategies and in, into in teaching and maybe disciplining kids and stuff. What was your experience with some of that? Yeah, like I'll be honest with you, know when I when I came into Strawberry Hill, there was a couple of older teachers there that, and I really learned a lot from them. Mm. It, like the teachers that were there, like there was, they were actually very kind, mm. and they really did me want the best for the kids. I never kind of experienced the whole old style print teacher. To be honest with you, I, I, like at the time, there was my first principal when I was in Strawberry Hill was Michael Walsh, He's still one of my best friends to this day. He's just retired there a number of years ago. Antonio Farrell was the deputy principal, and Paddy Lynch ended up taking over. And like they were nearly, I suppose ahead of their times and the way they kind of looked after and all the kids that kind of I suppose needed an arm around their shoulder they needed the kind of secure base and the secure attachment type relationship and they I kind of learned a lot from from them to be honest with you um I get what, what, I get where you're coming from yeah, like as course. well though because what what do the new did the new generation of teachers bring to yeah you? so <laughs> like like I suppose Teaching is completely different from when we started. Like, you know, it's very play based. Um, and, you know, the Ashton curriculum in the early years is excellent in terms of developing a play based pedagogy, you know, and you want your kids to be active in their learning. You want them to be, I suppose, engaged in learning. And that's the way kind of education is now. It's that it's very engaging and it's very active and I think that's what a lot of the new teachers that are, that are coming out are I suppose they're bringing to the table they're bringing a lot of like explorative learning as well which is which is really what going a lot of people want know what pedagogy means yeah it's, I suppose different types of ways ways of teaching things yeah. basically um, trying trying to do different types of ways of doing things like Ashtar for example I just give you an example of it in from junior infants to kind of second class you learn through a theme. So you might have the theme of, we'll say, the garden centre. And you'd have one station, which would be construction area, and they'd build the garden centre. Next would be a small world area where you'd have act out scenes in the garden centre. Or then likewise, then you'd have a socio dramatic area where they actually dress up and they do things. And we actually nearly bring in plants and they plant things for them. And then you have your junk art where you, where you use, use basically materials to make stuff that you might see in the garden center the same thing might be the airport it might be the so your te the the police station yeah. the hospital the doctors so you're trying to teach kind of social situations through through play basically and the like play bit learning did have like a, a kind of a critical pedagogy where the children up there would be very socially and politically aware and there'd be a sense of activism about it as well you know? yeah so um pretty much the same it's similar similar in educate together schools as well it? like and they're non denominate well non quality based so so like there's four pillars to educate together schools so one is their equality based child centered democratically run so we listen to the student voice and the parent voice and teacher voice and then it's co-educational so all education together schools are are co-educational uh, what do you know there's a lot of it, you, you know in your school do you notice a lot of the kids that are going there prefer to learn on a practical base, like the art, maybe the 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 P, maybe some of the maybe woodwork classes and things like that? Is that are are, you, are schools becoming more familiar around what's important to kids these days? Because not every child is academic, you know. Not every child wants to sit down and learn. Because we were speaking beforehand, you have the five fly and freeze. You know, I, I remember when I was in school. It, I wasn't academic and when I came across an issue on the board or on the maths book or whatever, I would freeze and yeah. then I would become very anxious. And then that voice in my head where I had this belief that I was stupid and taken would start playing, you know. Um, so what what's the approach? You, you know, if you have a child now that's dyslexic or dyspraxic or whatever, how do you approach a child like that today? Well, like, I suppose... You Early intervention is probably key, you know, and like what will happen a lot of the times is you kind of see it in the early classes and we, we like in our school, I'm just going to give you an example of we like this is probably different from a lot of schools, but in saying junior infants, what we try and do is we have a lot, a lot of outdoor learning. So then we have the literacy group in a small group. So half when the kids come in, actually we talk to you even about 
how we to start the day really yeah. because transition from home to school is a big thing. And um, I was talking to you beforehand, like about, you know, having a kind of trauma informed school and trauma aware school. And like one of the first things is the start of the day and the transition from home to school. So in our school, we, we started half past eight, but the gates open a quarter past. And the first thing, like first thing I do every morning is a quarter past, I stand at the gate and meet and greet, meet every child, either shake their hand, give them a high five or say hello to them. And just, it might be something small, but then there's another layer then that there's, we have more teachers afterwards after me who do the exact same thing. My deputy is brilliant. We've coupled some other teachers who do the exact same thing. But then you always have someone as well looking out for a child that is a bit anxious about coming to school and they're allowed to play in the yard for the first 15 minutes then. So then we go into class and we have a soft start and um, soft start is kind of just having manipulatives and you getting your getting your brain working through fine motor skills. It might be a small bit of building. It could be peg work or something like that. But it's important that that's done nearly in the, every classroom. I was just in a, in a school there. Blarney Street boys school there and it's boys and girls school now actually sorry and they they've they they had Sharon Lambert in with them and she actually said the same thing about having those fine motor activities as a kind of pr positive primer for the day it's priming the brain to get ready to learn so you're not like sitting down in the class right lads pro job busy at maths yeah straight away and then Barry do you remember them yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and then Barry <laughs> and head of van Barry head of Larry I seen a, I seen a something on social media it was a few years ago I think it was in Palestine. It was a in a school for I'm gonna say ten year old. There's a ten year old's class. There was a teacher, and when they he stand them by the door as the kids come into the school into the class, and he points to the wall and on the wall there's four or five different pictures. And yeah. One is a picture of somebody getting a hug. One is a high five. High five. One's a fist, fist bump, bump. And one is just yeah. being Milan. And he 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 when when he comes in he's waiting. The child then points to what they want. And then he gives yeah. them a hug, he gives them a fist bump, or he just leaves them alone. And, and you, they choose how they and, and you'd be surprised how common that is now in <laughs> schools. Like, you genuinely would. Yeah. And I, what I love sometimes is there, I, I had a, one of our junior infants there, and I send around the social story to our, all of our junior infants before they start school with, with things in it. To, kind of trying to get them ready for school and on one of them was a picture of me and saying this is Dave I'll be at the gate every morning I'll give you a high five and there was a couple of mornings I didn't give her a high five and she was giving out to her mom that I didn't give her a high five you know so it's amazing the small things yeah. make a big difference yeah. but having someone then on call ready to to see anyone who is anxious about coming to school and then having a, a safe space for them to go to in school then your your soft start and then we have a morning meeting so in the first 20 minutes of the day it's very very much getting children in a, in a ready to learn zone so that they're ready to learn. The morning meeting, they come in and they sit around in a circle kind of like this and they have a bit of a greeting first, introduce themselves to the group even though they know each other for, for years. Then we do a check-in, so it could be an emotional check-in where you, you, you kind of colour code it in zones of regulation or it could be at two thumbs. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling good but I'm feeling tired. Mm -hmm. But it's constantly developing that emotional literacy so that children can tell you how you feel. And then you can actually get into the learning side of thing after you have the, the positive start today and the positive primer of the day. Transitions then again, you, you know, mm. remember when you're in the yard, you go to the yard and you're playing ball and yeah. well, the game doesn't go your way and you're like a dog and T tensions are high like you take those games very seriously like yeah, you know then you're doing long division dominance there yeah so so like one of, we identified one of, that as a kind of a, a transition from yard back into school so how do you bring down the temperature so we step it so we have four whistles and then three and on th th those first four or three whistles the kids are allowed to walk around the yard and talk, but they have to tidy up and leave it in the place to, to leave it in the way they have it. So you're teaching them that they have a bit of responsibility and respect for their, their surroundings, but you're also just dialing down the temperature. Right. Like Dan Siegel, he calls it connect and redirect. You're allowing them to connect, but you're, you're redirecting them away from, from the highness. And then we bring them in together. We have two whistles and then one. And then we do a, a whole school breeding activity. So you're trying to teach them different breeding techniques that they can use as life skills and any kind of negative emotion using the 90 second rule to come out of like at the loop of negative emotions, you know? Mm -hmm. So those transitions and routines, like 
we were chatting a while ago about Bruce Perry and Bruce Perry, he talks about like the neurosequential model of therapeutics, but that's also translated to the neurosequential model of education. What does that even mean? What does it mean? Yeah, I was just going to say it like in layman's terms, like if you imagine it, like the brain as an upside down triangle, right? And you have the brain stem at the bottom. And if you're under chronic stress and you're under if you've experienced adverse childhood experience, adverse ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, or if you're in chron under chronic stress from a multitude of reasons, you're living in the brainstem, like you're living in in brain. amygdala hijack. You're you're basically fight or flight, fight or flight. And Bruce so Perry rational thinking. Yeah, but Bruce Perry, if you imagine the analogy of an upside down triangle, so at the bottom you have regulate. So a child needs to regulate before they can relate. Mm -hmm. And then they need to relate before they can reason. So what it's kind of saying is, right, allow a child to regulate first, then he can relate and form trusting relationships with the adults in the school. And then the executive function or the, the kind of like the learning can happen. So, so like, I kind of like the, start, the, start, the soft start. Yeah. You know, at the so, 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 so bringing it in softly at the start of the day, you're regulating them to get them ready to have relationships basically and positive relationships and then you can actually enable them to be ready to learn yeah, because and you don't actually know what where the, what a child is coming from you don't know where that child is coming from walking in your door they may have came from a home that there was mad stuff going on all night and they probably didn't get too much sleep you know there may have been violence or drug addiction or whatever else may have happened and they're walking in the door and their head is still stuck in them trying to understand what has just happened the night before yeah and they could be blaming themselves and there mightn't be no form at all t to relate but if you're going in there and they see a smiling face that can change the whole perception but if you're going they're going in there and there's a teacher shouting and roaring at them because they forgot their homework or didn't weren't able to do it that child is getting the message that Everybody, just, there's something wrong with me. Everybody's giving me shit. Everybody, yeah, and they start getting that core belief system. Then that we were speaking about earlier on, but just core beliefs starting to build up within the child at the young age because of the way adults are treating them, and then they start going on to start to believe that they're being they're bad people, and that's why everybody's treating them badly. They don't understand that yeah. maybe the adults in the family home are struggling with mental health or drug addiction or their own stuff. And maybe going into school, then they might be dealing with a teacher that doesn't read, it's not trauma informed and doesn't understand what's going on in that child's home. You know, can you? Yeah. Make like, a little bit about that. Even like, I suppose, even when you're going back, when you bring it back to, I suppose, the brain architecture and things like that, like when you're living in the, 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 the brain stem or the reptilian brain, you're kind of asking, am I safe? And then when you go to the limbic system, your emotional side is, am I loved? And then, the, so it's, those are the two kind of core things that you kind of need to think of, right? One, everyone needs to experience a secure base and a sense of safety. And sometimes that's important that like if a child doesn't experience that at home, that they do experience it at school. And there are a number of ways of doing that, like, like creating that consistency of approach, you know, like body language and tone. They're very, very important things. We spoke about restorative practice a while ago, yeah. which is fantastic, but it has to be integrated in, in which your body language and tone and it, a coin tone. And like, I suppose when I, when I think back, when I was sometimes we kind of, I know this is diverting from the question you asked me, but when I was a young teacher, like I'll never forget, like some, like some of the things that I suppose are, I was, you know, you you have misbehavior and you get triggered yourself and then you kind of nearly take it as a challenge and your body language goes wrong and your tone goes wrong and then you dysregulate the child more and then they dysregulate you more and it turns what could be a simple situation to fall, solve into a, a huge moment of de-escalation for both the adult and the child. So uh, for me, a trauma-informed approach actually is for the adult to be able to say, look, this is what's happening. I'm experiencing this regulation and I'm in now in a kind of fight, flight or freeze as well. And I kind of don't know how to handle it. So I just need to take 10 minutes to de yeah. to, to, to regulate, like, you know, to, and disengage for a couple of minutes 
so that I can actually come back in a meaningful way and show the child I care and I'm there for them. Mm. Sometimes actually leaving the situation is, is the best option, you know, mm. you know, but it's again, when you're particularly when you're a young teacher or when you've just started out, you feel like you need to solve all of the problems yourself or, or it's a sign of weakness mm. where it's not you know, a, like a lot of the times we have to be a small bit vulnerable and say, right, I just need to actually find out more and I need to regulate myself before I go back and actually yeah. deal is there with any, it. Is there any like a uh, trauma informed module or element to the core teacher training? No, not in, not in the public. Uh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. Because um, your, 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 your base and then the quality of uh, education, trauma-informed education based off, I suppose, the ethos of the principal or individuals. Yeah, do you know what I will say? Standardised. Do you know what I will say, right? So, like, I will say, like, there's a trauma-informed module in Minus in Criterion Tool has one there for the Masters in Education, and there's one in UCC as well. I think there's one in CIT with Judith as well. I don't know if you know Judith Butler yeah, and, and Maria Lottie, but they're not compulsory, they're elective, right? But what you have in kind of core education is a module on classroom management and a, I think a module on kind of like special aid, right? But the classroom management stuff is based on behaviorist principles like so again what i mean by that is like a star chart and a re reward good behavior conditioning but, yeah 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 psychology. conditioning like, why would yeah. something so important not be compulsory within the yeah structure of, of the teachers it's it's just i suppose a lot of kind of systems working in silos if you look at you look at what it would mean for a teacher to be trauma informed that could change the whole outcome of a child's belief of of how school is and I, that's that actually brings me to actually how it happened for me to be honest with you um as i said it was principal in strawberry hill and so I was also kind of quite involved in Young Knock at the time. It's Let's Grow Together Now. And we were getting a lot of training. And at the time, um, the, the Cork City Council kind of funded Karen Treisman. I don't know if you've ever. It was that at uh, Yeah. And City Hall. Yeah. So you had the two. There was, I was one in City Hall and one in Rochestone Park. I was at the City Hall one a couple of days there. Yeah. And for me, that was kind of transformational in my approach in education, to be honest with you. I found that when you when i learned about stress and the brain chronic stress in the brain adverse child ex experiences how all of those things how all of those things impact on a child's natural development you once you know it once you once you once you know it you can't unknow it mm. and that's what i found was that like it was that kind of layer of knowledge that was missing um Likewise, I don't know if you've ever come across nurture training. Um, Susan Givney, de Givney delivers it in Ireland. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of kind of trauma informed kind of principles behind nurture trains. Essentially, what a nurture room is, it's based on attachment theory. So attachment theory is basically when when you're young, you're born and you form a bond with a, a caring adult. Normally, it's your mom. And basically, when you cry, you're soothed. When you're upset, you, she knows how to soothe you, and it, it those interactions form an attachment theory. Sometimes those things are missing. Yeah. So a nurture room basically is a room in, in the school that has a kitchen area, has a living room area, and kids are brought there. And the first thing they do is actually have a cup of tea, a slice of toast with with a trusted adult. So you're going to have one of those in not any secondary school above oh, for the first years going in. They have a, a kitchen space, yeah. a seat, sitting seating area, and they just all the first years go in there and they have their lunch up there. For the first year, yeah. And and I think again though those trauma farm principles, like I was talking to another one of the principal and he he was an older principal and he said, I just wish I when I was in college in the eighties I I was taught about this because it would have changed some of the moments that you had over the course of your 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 teaching career you know and it's no fault of any no, teacher no because it's like nobody intentionally treats another human being in in, in the wrong manner it's, it's just it's just some some conditioning and i suppose when you know better as gillian butler says yeah you do better, you do better. And it's, it's actually so true yeah. you know like 
But why are we so like why is the trauma informed thing only coming around now when psychologists have probably been talking about trauma's effect on people for hundred years? Yeah. Like do you know what they say about research it takes like twenty or thirty years for actually research tech. You'll be dead and buried practice. by the time that oh, yeah, be- sorry, yeah, I know. <laughs> but it, it's it's so true, isn't it? It yeah. does t- it does it's a long it, time, it take a long time for it to go. Wrap my head around is why the answers are there for the education system. Why aren't they being implemented for the best education system to teach yeah. every child that has their own individual learning differences and behavioural issues? The right way. Is there objections to it from the Department of Education or is there a, so. a clash in ideologies or like? Like, do you know, it's funny you say it like because like, do you know, in the US at the moment, it's very partisan between the Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. I was talking to a, to a guy over there in, in he's a, he works in sustainability in the US and I was talking to him recently and he was saying like every time you kind of put some sort of intervention in sustain- sustainability, it's kind of, you have to be very, it's a very, very thin line because it's so partisan, you know. Yeah. In Ireland, I don't think there is, but what I think it is, is that there's just too many silos in our system. Like, there's too many, there's no mo- no real joined up thinking, where you even, even within, I suppose, Department of Education, there's so many different silos doing different things and everyone means well. Everyone's trying to do the right thing, but it's just that there's no kind of joined up thinking to pull it all together. And even the way trainings are delivered, again, it's, it becomes really, really challenging because there's loads of different silos. And likewise, there's a bit of gatekeeping then as well. There's, there's kind of, sometimes there's this, an element of this is the way we've always kind of done it like, you know, mm. so, so like, I think it's just that lack of joined up thinking is the, is the difficulty. Mm. I think we, we met um, the Secretary General of the Department of Education a few weeks ago. Very nice fella. I have his number on my phone. Could text him there. there. Bring him on. Or yeah, yeah. Phone call, say, oh, he's the man that can get it done. Like, like if, it would, if, it, if it was a directive from the department, then yeah. like if you want this teaching job, you have to do this. And then, then as Timmy is right, like it's the evidence is clear. Why why isn't it being done? Yeah, and like I I, I don't know who was saying this, but I, I think you're at the same conference as me. Trauma and farm practice is based practice. Like yeah. it it creates the conditions. There's for, no for, like for learning that ambiguity around that. Uh, no, I mean, there's that's not up for debate. Like, but is there a sense of some principals and some schools uh, they don't want to deal with um, the, those type of children and I'm not going to name no schools yeah, yeah. like that but there was a certain couple of schools in the north side that would have different ideologies around this stuff in this school here they'll get expelled for innocuous stuff and they end up over in this school then who would see that innocuous stuff as the trauma response you know Yeah. yeah. but from this school, school's perspective and I don't know anybody in this school in this school's perspective it's easier for them to just get rid of those challenging children and just be left with the people that are academically able and motivated. Yeah. And then you have the more uh, principals like yourself, then you see that challenging child and you see a lot of potential there. You see, you see the child that needs to be helped, not the student that's causing your problems. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would say what I kind of think sometimes is like... You have to be careful no, no, no. your uh, principal uh, yeah. conference there. You'll be... No, do you, know what, do you know what I was thinking? I was thinking as you were talking there, you know? Yeah. Like... The transition thing, going back to even the transition and like in general primary schools, to be honest with you, because you have the same teacher all day long and because you don't have exams, Mm. your kids get really taken care of, like in in modern primary schools. But we've always said that, like in primary school, the one teacher, they know you, the family and all that. When you go into secondary, it is a culture shock. Yeah, it is, yeah. And it's very much like um, you're in science, maths, geography, 40 minutes the buzzer goes, different class, different teacher. Some children get lost in that, and I did myself. Yeah, and also there's like inconsistency as well in terms of like personalities. Like yeah. so, so you're like, if you have a child that's actually has experienced trauma and like, we might even talk about the terminology of the whole trauma thing there in a while as well, yeah. because like that's that actually brings another thing. I know Don hates it, the whole trauma informed practice thing, yeah. like, and it's like 
and I kind of would be similar. I think it's a kind of a basic human right, to be honest yeah. with you. I'd nearly prefer to see it as like humor, human centered education as yeah. opposed to trauma, yeah. like th that it's for everyone. It's not for yeah. the, the, the percentage that has, have experienced trauma. This is, yeah. this is, this is but it's for everyone. everyone. It's, it's for everyone to understand so they can understand each other. Yeah. So, and they can treat each other with respect and not throw down judgment in somebody who behaves in a different way to the way they do or the way they have taught to be normal growing yeah. up because, and that's what trauma, that's, that's, that's the best understanding for me around trauma informed and what it means to me is so others who don't understand it and who haven't lived that exact experience as this child here, who's been completely traumatized growing up because of their environment. So this human being here who has had a loving and caring family, school, all these different things growing up can understand why this child here is behaving in this way. Yeah. And they can have some compassion and care for, yeah. for them without no judgment. And look after and people yeah. and, and kind of engage in people to look after each other. And that's, that, that's why I would love for everybody to get trauma informed. Yeah. I think it's something that we should introduce into schools at the youngest possible age for them to understand where they can understand did the whole subject because it will change humanity and that people will treat each other. They'll look across the when it's like, it's like this, if there's a teacher up there and they're talking about trauma and foreign practice on the board and there's two children here sitting down and there's this child here who's had all the best things growing up this and, and there's another child over here and they have nothing and they're actually worried about what they're going home to. That child that's sitting here on the left might look at the board and they might have a, an aha moment because what the teacher's trying to explain in the board and they look off to that child and say, fuck, I never again going to speak like him, like that to him, or going to treat him like that, or going to bully him or pull him down, you know, and that's, that's what's important to me. And but having kids can have it. And teaching a bit of compassion as well for each other, yeah. And like, back to kind of what we were saying, like the whole, I think that there is a big, a big kind of like, like one, I suppose, the positive side of things, like we, we, I think we all know some amazing school completion workers as well. Yeah. Who like, like yeah, talking. I was just chatting earlier about Ingrid there, who is a really good friend of mine. Does amazing work and has been since I know her. Like going back like fifteen years up in up up in up in the north side schools. I think like support for all of those type of organisations, like like our school completion programs. I think we need more kind of support where we can have like trusted adults like for like like Ingrid is doing nurture and and her team all the guys in in the school community team they are they they do nurture without even never been trained in it mm. do you know they are trauma informed without even realizing they have been for the last 15 years so some of it comes from a bit of intuition as well like you know but again the exam system in, in, in the secondary schools doesn't help. It doesn't help our most vulnerable kids anyway. Definitely mm. not like, you know, like mm. it, because again, it adds another layer of accountability and high stakes accountability in terms of like, you know, we're probably at an age now of like well-being and identity and learning where we're trying to bring well-being and learning together. That's what Andy Hargraves would say anyway, right? But, you know, it's really, really difficult when at the end of the day, in secondary schools, we have to prepare the kids for exams. Mm. And ultimately, sometimes that just becomes the bottom line when kids go into secondary school for, for schools is like exam, uh, the exam, the exams become, I suppose, they have to, they have to power, like it's the exam becomes like a powerful thing where you're kind of, where it can define your, your life outcomes, you know, mm. and that's, I think, I think one of the problems in secondary school is like creating, exams. yeah, the pressure of exams and then yeah. the pressure of exams on teachers mm -hmm. and on staffs. Have you any opinions on a better system for secondary school? I think gems on a personal level, I think. We should focus more on well-being and give and ensure kids how to regulate and how to process stuff. And I think the educational stuff, once they can do that other stuff, the education will come second hand mm. because they'll be able to focus more because they're regulating because they know how to, they know how to talk, they can understand 
their own stuff that's going on from in their lives, yeah. you know, and, and and they're not afraid to talk. You know, the, the, and education is very, very important. But but all the children are getting lost in the education yeah. system because they can't, they they haven't got the ability to, to get the education. Yeah. In in primary schools, actually, there's a new curriculum coming. Yeah. This year, actually, and well-being is an actual for the first time is a strand that's given the same time allowance. Now they've grouped in well-being with uh, with like physical education and well-being and kind of SBHE kind of stuff, but it's been given the same same time allowance now as literacy and numeracy, which is really kind of mm. I suppose. That's well, good. It's a really, it's a really change. positive change, and it's that's an, it's a new curriculum that has just come in for all primary schools. Like it, it's not like. It's literally, it was in the draft kind of framework for the last couple of years, but it's in, it's being embedded over the next two years, which is really positive as well, like, you know. Talk to us about your own framework. Um, my own framework, yeah, so my kind of, my, the title of my PhD is, it's a, uh, it's bear with me now because when I say it there, sometimes people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, it's the design development, or design implementation and evaluation of a systems and trauma reform model of positive education. So. What I've kind of looked at was the first thing I looked at really was the literature on positive education um, and positive education is applying positive psychology to education settings. And um, do, you ever, do you know Martin Seligman, have you ever heard of him? No. He the kind of coined the phrase um, positive psychology and then positive education came from it. And there was a number of studies done in different places of about apply, applying positive education and how it it can how basically well-being and academic achievement can actually go hand in hand you can actually have both it, it's like not what saying, Nick. exactly exactly what you're saying basically so that's what kind of positive education is and um so then i kind of was looking at the literature and i read this book called contextual well-being by a lady over in australia called helen street and who subsequently i've had numerous kind of like uh, Zooms with, it was during, I read it during lockdown and we had a couple of Zoom messages too. And basically she kind of argues that well-being and positive education and well-being in schools is kind of like, you can't have a one for one, one, one model fits all. It's all based on context. Every, every school context is different because of the location, because of the people. And basically she kind of looked at kind of how, I suppose every context is different, but you have to kind of co-create your model with the school. So what I kind of did then was I kind of said, right, look, I'm going to, I'm going to look at well-being of principals, look at well-being of, and I'm going to interview principals. I'm going to look at well-being of teachers. I'm going to look at well-being of kids through a student voice piece. And kids was a great one, actually, because I did a photo voice piece, let them take pictures of what makes them feel well in school. And then they kind of led the interview rather than me and interviewing it. And then I kind of put together a framework based on that and, their, and the parent voices too. I'm putting the framework together. And, and what I kind of put together, first of all, was about collective teacher efficacy the power of the team and having consistency amongst the adults like what's collective teacher efficacy yeah, yeah so it's a concept um, by a researcher called john hattie and basically it just shows that the collective beliefs belief among staff and the collective practice among staff far is far more it produces far more successful student outcome than any other thing or the collective belief is everybody believing everyone believing that they can make a difference but everyone Instead actually acting on it as well on it as well we can all say we can all believe say, yeah but it's the action means more exactly than anything else. so it's like this collective kind of collective culture is yeah. what i call it right so i kind of looked at that then and i was like what what consistency is needed in schools so we, we looked at touch points, right? Kind of the, some of the things we were talking about a while ago, the greeting in the morning, the meet and greet, greet and end and send. How do we meet in, in the morning and how do we send them away? There's another one then like, like checking in, I try and check in on the staff every morning, every morning, regardless. I heard, I heard a principal in Dublin refer to it as talking the kids into bed. Mm -hmm. So you go around just for, it takes 15 minutes of your time. You can spare 15 minutes of time to make sure all the staff are okay, but then if there's any problem with any kids or any kind of 
child that's worried or anxious or or having a difficulty that basically I know about it and we can do something about it and we can bring someone in to help them. Um, so in having that kind of as a collective practice, basically, how our routines are, how our transitions are and our language, what language we use to get attention, what language we use, having a neuroformative strength, strength based language like so. Every school, every school in the country will have autistic children in their class. They'll have children with various other different needs, but having the respectful language around around it yeah. and having it as a as a kind of like a collective language base that we actually use mm -hmm. across the school and it's a respectful language. You said something there, Dave, Dave and um, I, I just think it's important to ask you this question because I'm after asking it to a few academics and experts that we've had in the past. What do you believe the rise in uh, autistic kids is today compared to what, what it was years ago? Well, that's, There's such a debate around is it the food? Is it what we're drinking? Is it processed food? Is it sugars? Or is it just pollution in the environment? You know, or is it just that? Years ago, we didn't know what ought be more than yeah. I think. I think, like, is what studies done? I, I wouldn't know to be honest with you, yeah. and I don't know that. Like, I will say, like, I suppose awareness is a kind of a thing if you, did, if you don't, if you didn't know what to look for, and mm -hmm. then again, like, we could be coming, you could be coming back in 20 years, and like, at the moment, like, the, the, the. Girl, girls kind of have different autistic traits than boys. So yeah. we could come back in 20 years and say we missed all of this as well in 20 years in girls, yeah. you know, because girls typically would have the kind of, would would have a quieter yes. demeanor. Yeah. So you just don't know. It's the same with ADHD. It's the same with, ADHD. It's the same with any, any, I suppose, additional need that's there. Awareness is everything, so you just don't know. It could always have been there. It's just now we're more aware of things. Do you know in your school, is it expensive for ch for ch people to send, or is it? Oh, no, it's free. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and actually, yeah, no, just not. So it's not like this kind of posh school is for it's not. everybody. No. And, and like, to be fair, like, I'm going to be the first to say it as well. Like, well, we have fantastic staff and we have a fantastic school. We have fantastic parents and fantastic children, but there are loads of fantastic schools that are doing the same, if not more, in yeah. mind. Like, like schooling now, it, it like in primary level is, is fantastic, you know? And like, there are schools around the country doing amazing, amazing stuff. And you have to take your hand off to the teachers. Yeah. You have to, like, because I tell you, they're doing some amazing work. I've, I've been working with different teachers in the last few years around different projects and whatever else. And I have to say it, like, the compassion and understanding that they have for some of the, some of the kids, so particularly those kids that are are struggling and who have be behavioural issues, you know, it's like they understand them and they can meet them at their level. I think it's amazing, and and there's a lot to be said for for teachers and as well. Can I just say one thing as well? Like on that, like one of the things when I did the research with teachers, you know, and you might think you might think it was like dealing with behaviours was kind of driving was it, I call it either enabling enabling well-being or um inhibiting well-being right you think it's actually dealing with the behavior that is the thing that inhibits well-being that's not at all actually what it is is that what I, what i found was that talking to talking through it is it's the occupational guilt of not knowing what to do and how to help the child everyone really wanted to help the children but so it's it's the access to services mm. like children that have sensory difficulties, sensory processing difficulties, not having access to an OT to tell you how you can help the child in school. It created this mad sense of occupational guilt. And that was the inhibitor of well-being, not actually the actual dealing. I think everyone wants to, wants to, I suppose, you know, do the right thing by children, but it's the guilt of just not knowing what to do. Mm. So I think like access to services was, it was, a thing and also what I've kind of done as well, I've brought in an occupational therapist into my training program. Like, I, th I thought it was kind of funny there you calling me like an expert or an academic or an academic. I don't think I'm any of them to be honest, I'm sure, right? Not well, you're going to be perceived now. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not but, one of them at all, to be but, honest. But listen, you, you know a lot but, more than most people. Yeah, but look. And that, that, that today, uh, where, we're, where we're living in a uh, Society where there's such a lack of of knowledge around trauma informed and all these other issues that we're having, 
somebody that knows more than others is definitely somebody that but if you do phd you're an expert uh, well, no okay in, yeah but that, uh, when my buddies give me a slagging about that you're being you know? humble my, my my buddies no i'm not like because if you knew my group of friends there no they actually bring, will bring you down to yeah. bring you down to life fairly yeah. quickly like and they, they don't was, be calling yourself doctor any no, type soon with no, the boys, like. I, I try and do it for the laugh but they, <laughs> they, 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 they're they they're literally take the piss completely out of me <laughs> But what I was kind of saying is that, like, yeah, I am an expert in a tiny little area. Like, yeah. it's one tiny, 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 tiny. Well, area. Important, but yeah. it is important. Like, but kind of what I was kind of saying as well is like, I kind of know my limitations too, you know. Yeah, that and that's really important to know my limitations. So what I've done for my own kind of training pro program is called the Well Schools Network. It's it's a spin out from my PhD. So basically, we've turned my PhD project into into an actual tangible program that schools can do right but what I've done is that like I felt a bit disingenuous going in well I haven't done it but going attempting to go in and talk about like when we're talking about sensory sensory difficulties like and yes I do know the different types of sensory breaks and our staff would know but I I don't feel equipped to teach yeah, what an occupational therapist can teach the staff yeah. so like we can all have therapeutic moments in our day like but actually getting training from a trained professional to show you how to do it properly is really really important so i brought an occupational t uh, therapist um my ot and me she is jess kennedy she's a phenomenal person but to teach the staff how to actually give the right type of sensory break mm -hmm. talking about dysregulated adults and children but like sometimes knowledge again is everything right and if you have a child who's dysregulated and you bring them outside and have them running around it actually makes them become more dysregulated mm -hmm. so the jess or ot will teach you how to actually calm down the the um the hyper child like not even the hyper child like it's just a child that just needs a calming break uh, so and the language around it a calming and organizing break or an alerting break I put the red bull back in the fridge yeah or the yeah the, the prime my young fella is on about that all the yeah, time yeah. he sees it on the telly all the time but you know yeah. like yeah, i told him he's I, not allowed till he's 18. i seen duns the other day did a lot of them we're off topic a little bit yeah only four per customer. They were normally buying this stuff, like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What she said, do you know that stuff? That started off with a price tag of fifteen pounds. I know. Initially. Ridiculous. Yeah. Oh Jesus, man! I was over in England last year with Smartfell and his friends, and we were at a match, and it was a big deal. Like the kids were literally like crying on the streets for their mums and dads oh, yeah. because it was on YouTube every day. Oh, really? Harry oh, Parker, oh, yeah, 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 that's a, that's what my I, and my it was fellow I've never, like, I've never let him have, have yeah. anything like that. Like, sure, right. and but yeah, right, like, it's funny. Like, it's like, what's this prime, Dad? What's this yeah. prime? He's always that about like, yeah. but yeah. but you know, it's it's a lot of shit. Tell him, yeah, <laughs> just get him an empty bottle and put some diluted into it. Yeah. Yeah. But then, then yeah. also, I suppose one of the things then as well, I suppose that the student voice part told me, okay, like and like we do a lot of outdoor learning, so yeah. outdoor learning and sustainability and teaching children about like sustainable environments. Not it's actually not teaching them, it's actually just getting them playing outdoors actually gives them an appreciation of it. But a mad one for you actually, right? This is, is a mad one because one of the things that came up for me was that the kids actually it wasn't actually doing well in school or achieving. They enjoyed learning, like cognitive well-being and metacognition and learning how we learn. Kids really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. like. I found it mad. Yeah. None of the adults actually picked up on that, to be honest with you. Yeah. When I, when because I did a lot of interviews, a lot of focus groups with teachers, principals, but no one actually kind of said, ah, the learning side of things is kind of, um, is, is like, except the kids. And they were adamant about it, but I tell you, they were just like, literally, they were kind of saying, yeah, we love learning. And I was like, it has to be your art or it has to be your, no, no, we love all the parts of it. We all love the actual, they loved, I think it was just like that learning at their at their at their own level was fun for them it's like, fun for them yeah and i think that's what kind of yeah. that's a thing that we hadn't even thought about if i'm a principal in a school and i'm listening to this or watching this on youtube where they should subscribe by letter <laughs> but you know if i was in if i was a principal and I, have, I was responsible for a school and i wanted my staff trained in this workshop here our program how would they go about it just contact you can contact me dave at wsn.ie is is my email i will say as well like i'm going to say 
Like it's not like a like ev- I think sometimes everyone looks for a quick fix, right? No. And a, and a, like a toolbox or or a golden pill or something like that. No. It kind of doesn't work like that, right? There are some brilliant, brilliant people out there that has training, like nurt- nurt- training for nurture rooms is fantastic. Mm. Um, what what I do is really really good. Um, there's other ones like there's other programs as well that are trauma informed. Like I did a program called the Berry Street Model of Education as well, fantastic as well. It, they're based in Australia. Like it's kind of like what's your what what fit is your is going to fit your school like mm. you know like if you're if you're with a staff that are open to trauma and farm practice and open to this by all means give me a call like you yeah. know talking about staff say i'm out, uh, i want to work in your school as a teacher and you're interviewing me what are you looking for in the teacher they have their degree and they might have their masters but what set what what sets them apart like what's the type of personality what's the type of for your culture in your school what are you looking for Compassion, I think, is one thing. Um, how do you find the whole public in house compassion to someone that's, that's probably faking the arse off? You? Yeah, like some sometimes, Central. sometimes you can. Yeah, I've had I have some fabulous people, like, like, just going, I'll give you an example, right? And I can give you an example of what is the wrong answer. What? <laughs> no, it was the wrong answer to the question. Yeah. But for me, it was the right answer. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Honesty, I suppose. Yeah, it was really honest. But like, so basically, it was a it was a question um, about like, what's well, the first thing if you do? You're you're teaching an autism class, and what's the first thing you do? And she could said, "Well, I wouldn't look at their reports for for, for a couple of weeks because I'd like to get to know the individual child first. No judgment. And I was kind of like, that's probably the wrong answer. But for me, that was the right thing. Yeah. Because she wanted to do the right thing by the child. And she didn't want to kind of say, look, she didn't want to look at a farm or an assessment. She'd go in with bias then. And go in saying, oh, this child does this and does that. But I was kind of like, it was probably the wrong answer. But I really like how. Yeah. yeah. I really, you know what I mean? How that could have went wrong for her if it was a different school. Uh, if yeah. that was a different school, that could have, she would have. Last the interview straight away. So, so I kind of, I kind of, it wasn't actually the right answer, but it was, it was, I like the way she kind of came about it. I and then, that's the right I, I, think, I think as well, like having examples, like when people give you examples about, about that themselves, themselves, yeah, you can kind of see the human touch a small bit. Because mm-hmm. you can yeah. see the emotion, you, know, yeah. you can't fake emotion. No, you can't, you can't, you genuinely can't, like, mm-hmm. and like you, you can't fake. Genuine, uh, you'll get the energy. Empathy, yeah, you'll get the and it's just, it's, it's there, James. No, the yeah. emotion comes through experience, their own experience, particularly you, if they're talking about it. And it, you can't, I don't think you can actually, empathy is another thing that like, you spoke about compassion and empathy. Like, I don't think you can fake empathy. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like it's empathy is a thing that's either in here or, or it's not like, you know, and like, to be honest with you, I hate interviews anyway, because I think they're the, the most false things of all time. Yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? But at the same that, time, yeah, but at the same time, evil, isn't it? Yeah, it is, they are necessary. But and like what you're talking about there is goes back to Carl Rogers, person sent like where he was talking about like it doesn't matter who you are if you're working in a capacity where you're helping a vulnerable person, you have to be compassionate, you have to be empathetic, unconditional positive regard. Yeah. Like these are non-negotiables. That's and actually you, one of the principles of, of what I say yeah, as well. Uh, unconditional about, positive regard. Yeah, well, if you're looking for a wingman on one of them <laughs> uh, workshops, <can> <laughs> yeah, on the ball, I'd love it. Is there anything you'd like to add before we finish? No, I t- like just thanks a million. Um, you know, it's lovely to have the chat. Really, to be honest with you, yeah, very, very interesting. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you for coming like, out. And again, like, you know, like I kind of like it's it, teaching is a hard job. Like, and I suppose like principal being a principal is a really hard job too, you know, but it kind of everyone, in, I suppose, just trying to make sure every trying to, what I'm trying to do is trying to make, inform people and give people the bit of knowledge. Cause when you know, you know, and you can do something about it and like, what you're doing is changing lives. Dude. Yeah, like, and it's kind of like, do you ever see, I, I showed this video this morning at, at a workshop we was doing, you know. Do you ever see the video of Ian Wright there with Mr. Pigeon? Yeah. 
that shows the power of one good adult. Yeah. I think that video, like, it's very an emotive thing. You see it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, it oh, puff, man. Puff. He was a bit of a wild child. Yeah. Yeah. He, he looked at jail, didn't he? He did, yeah. Uh, you, you detention. He was on a bad pass, but there was this one teacher that looked after him yeah. and really nurtured him, didn't he? But yeah. they were reunited for a BBC documentary a couple of years ago, but oh, yeah. he was wrong crying, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, but Ian Wright thought he was dead, you know? Yeah. And Ian Wright went from, like, being, like, a man in his 50s to be in like a five they brought him out as a surprise you know in, and I swear to God it just shows you the importance of one what one good adult can do like and that's kind of like I all, we all have one someone yeah, like that we, that's why you get emotional even think because we all have that one adult in our lives or two maybe you'd be bald enough if you saw this video yeah. like, genuinely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> what I always say to the staff like is imagine right every adult in the in the whole building was your one good adult right and imagine the transformational power that can have right and like one of my teachers one of my teachers summed it up brilliantly one day and probably in better way that i could is like like we were kind of thinking of ways to kind of sum things up about what we want to do or what we want to be and she summed it up brilliantly she said she loved the saying of be the teacher that you needed when you were a child that's it boy. and I think that kind of that is it kind of leave it like that, that like so so if every teacher kind of had that and it's both trauma informed knowledge and then apply it all the child and finding out what they need to isn't it that could be take time but even like the it having them that one a good adult or a school full of good al adults can be a brilliant counterweight to the difficulties they experience at home well relationship is the buffer like relationship is the big regulator like I know I've, Bruce Perry there, we were talking about him. We should so. get him on, actually. There's a lot of talk about Bruce. Yeah, you should get him. Yeah, we should actually. <laughs> Leave it with me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. But basically, he, lo he often says it. Yeah. Relationship is the buffer. Yeah. And relation, relational, relational, relational regulation is the best form of regulation. Yeah. You know, so, so it's kind of about the people. and about yeah. the Good way to finish, Dev. Thanks, Will. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Will. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks, everybody, next week. God bless, lads.